Okay, we're going to start this presentation right now. Uh, looks like all the technology is ready to go. Roger. Okay. So welcome everyone to the Autism 206, Mental Health and Autistic Adults with Intellectual Impairment, Autism 200 series. Um, we are uh, coming to you live, all of us from our various sites, um, doing this remote and online. And the panel presentation in this forum is a little tricky, so bear with us if there's any glitches. Um, we're just excited to have this presentation tonight for you, and uh, we want to welcome you. So my name is Katrina Davis, and I am uh, a family advocate at the Seattle Children's Autism Center. I have a 20-year-old autistic young man who uh, very much fits the community we're talking about tonight. Uh, I want to acknowledge that he's a very resilient, powerful, and important young man in many people's lives. I thank him for being him uh, and for redefining what it means to be normal. Okay, so welcome to our Ta Autism 200 series, focusing on topics affecting adult autism community. During the summer, we always focus on adult topics. And thank you uh, for joining us online, all of you out there in uh, web land. Thanks to our panelists who are with us tonight, and I will introduce them in a moment. And uh, I really appreciate them joining us to share their expertise and guidance on this important topic affecting so many of our autistic adults. Um, tonight, our talk is on autistic adults with intellectual impairment and co-occurring mental health conditions. And coincidentally, last night, the Arc of King County also held a webinar, a webinar on this topic. So it's, it's on everyone's mind these days. We know full well that the autism community uh, includes individuals without intellectual impairment who have co-occurring mental health conditions. And the Autism 200 in August, on August 20th, will uh, feature panelists discussing mental health and autism uh, for individuals not enrolled in the DDA system. And we really wanna take a minute to acknowledge those autistic individuals who do not qualify or who are not enrolled in DDA for various reasons. Uh, we hope that viewing maybe both these summer series will give you some insight. Uh, this presentation will be viewable uh, at Seattle Children's Facebook site, like you're watching tonight for a long time, as well as um, it will be downloaded and viewable on YouTube uh, as part of our Autism 200 series. And our um, amazing tech team will show you in our chat room various links to what we mentioned tonight. So thanks to Stacy for monitoring your comments and your questions tonight and all the folks from the Seattle Children's tech team behind the scenes making this possible. So I want to introduce our panelists. And you can go to the next slide, thank you. Tonight's panelists include David O'Neill. He's the Director of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities a Program at Sound Mental Health. We have Melanie Strait. She is an intensive case manager supervisor at DDA and the parent of an adult with co-occurring mental health and ASD. And lastly, we have Dan Peterson. He's a mental health resource manager at DDA. So tonight we'll be discussing services, navigation tips, um, uh, barriers, and our hope for the future of autistic adults with intellectual disability, or IDD as we call it, and co-occurring mental health conditions. So we're not quite there yet on that slide, so you don't have to go there yet. <laughs> That's okay, we'll get to that one at the end. Um, you can go back to it, yeah, there you go. Uh, so there are many co-occurring conditions That might, sorry, a little glitch there. There are many conditions that might accompany an autism diagnosis. How they manifest varies from one autistic person to the next. The conditions that overlap with autism generally fall into one of four groups categories. There's medical conditions, developmental diagnoses, genetic conditions, and health conditions such as ADHD, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. Or that's where we're going to be focusing tonight. So you're, tu you're tuning in tonight and trying to watch me talk and I know I'm glitching out, so hang in there. Um, you're tuning in because you or someone you care about is an autistic with IDD and has a mental health condition. You have faced barriers and challenges with diagnosis, treatment, crisis services, management and systems. Not to mention the lack of understanding and unfair stigmas associated with co-occurring mental health conditions, leaving many of you marginalized, overlooked and grossly underserved. Often plummeting you and your family into crisis with little or no accommodating service. Now with COVID and the looming budget cuts to social services, there is more fear the needs of those with autism 
and co-occurring mental health conditions will move deeper into health harming and unethical predicaments. As one parent of an adult with IDD and autism and co-occurring mental health conditions said to me just this week, I dream of systems that recognize how hard it is already and do what they can to lift our families up, not put us through nonstop obstacle courses needed stress. So with that, um, there are three people in our community who I know professionally and for many years now, and these, these three amazing people can offer some pointing us in the right direction at least and giving us the lay of the land. Thank our three panelists. And I'm going to let everyone know that they'll be answering assigned questions tonight. But we've encouraged them to chime in at, with their varying expertise and perspectives at any time, knowing that we have about 8.15. We're going to go till 8.30 tonight. We want to try. So I'll do my best to be the timekeeper. And um, I'll start with uh, David. And uh, David, I'm going to uh, start with the first question here. Mental health providers have sometimes said they don't treat autism, but the autism is not what we're asking them to treat. These are individuals with autism, and we're asking them to really look and treat at the mental health condition, the anxiety, the depression, the ADHD, et cetera. What advice would you give to those seeking treatment for co-occurring mental health conditions? Well, uh, let's see. Um, people with IDD and autism, uh, are more likely to experience mental health conditions. I think you kind of touched on that in your intro about this overlap that we have. Um, and there's a number of biopsychosocial reasons around that. Um, I think prevalence numbers tell us that individuals with autism have high incidences of trauma, which I don't think you had on your list there. Um, increased depression and anxiety. Uh, and actually, for those that have access, we see some comorbidity with substance use. Um, and there's some predispositions, I think, that, that play into that, that people need to understand when you're talking about mental health providers. I think the idea that they, um, they don't have a, a description of the behaviors through mental health language, and that makes it challenging for mental health providers to understand exactly what it is they're treating. They know about these mental health disorders, but they don't necessarily know about that autism and the overlap. Um, there's some you know, predisposition around this sensory regulation and social understanding uh, that are related to emotional regulation and executive functioning, which of course those two things relate to mental health directly. Um, thought patterns contribute to mental health and, and the kind of treatment that you might get. Me medical conditions contribute to mental health and vice versa. Um, negative life experiences and being in marginalized communities contribute to mental health. These are things that we know as a mental health community. And I think being able to articulate that to mental health providers um, would go a long way in having them maybe um, come to some understanding. There is very limited education and clinical experience in the mental health world um, with ASD and IDD. Uh, most people in their master's program in their, did not have a course, or, or if they did, it was a, a small piece of one of their courses about intellectual developmental disabilities and autism. So that that has been, um, you know, lacking in, in uh, people's education as they move forward. I think there was a part two to that or not. I can't remember. <laughs> did I answer all the questions? Yeah, thank you. No, great. Yeah, you were getting there, actually. I was, the next question is, what can we do or what's being to educate the routers? development conditions um, and how to differentiate that from the mental health condition. Okay. Um, the, this idea about educating mental health professionals, like I said, it's not available. You're not going to get that necessarily in school. So how are these neurodevelopmental conditions like IDD and autism um, going to get attention? I think, you know, we're doing one of those right now. Hopefully we have not just people in the IDD world, but we have people in the mental health world um, as these worlds continue to collide. Um, I think that the, what, what we have is that both the IDD, autism, and mental health disorders need to be assessed and, di and diagnosed and treated. Um, you know, that there's appropriate treatment for some of the things and the, the challenges that, that autism presents. And then there's, you know, evidence-based practices for how to deal with mental health disorders. 
So I think both those things need to be addressed. And I think sometimes the mental health provider has a hard time differentiating um, between those two things. Um, there's more and more research being done all the time. We're seeing genetic influences. Um, we're seeing, um, for an example, something like Fragile X has like a 95% comorbidity rate with autism. And Fragile X has a certain you know, behavioral phenotype, which includes some depression, it includes how this individual thinks. Um, it includes some medical concerns, right? So kind of understanding that IDD piece, um, understanding how to use the resources available for from the DDA system um, in combining with the mental health system. And that's, that's um, I think gets down to the biggest thing is we have to make it important. The, the state Medicaid plan has in, you know, all these treatments. Um, but if people aren't able to access that treatment, um, then they're not going to necessarily get it, right? So um, I know we've, been, and Dan may talk about this later, but the idea that um, DDA shouldn't pay for something that the Medicaid state plan pays for. Well, if you can't access it because nobody's providing it within the Medicaid state plan, um, DDA has done an amazing job with trying to find new resources and ways to do this. Um, most of the research around autism tends to be in children, and here we are talking about adults, but most of the treatment, ABA and things like that were designated for children and only paid at for children. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think it's important to note that like, I think some of the research, and I can send you research articles later to tag onto this talk, but about 70% of um, children with autism experience significant mental health symptoms and through their lifespan, people with autism, about 60% of people will um, maybe meet criteria for two or more conditions. So I think that's pretty serious about education and I think getting mental health providers to hear this information um, and to be able to sort of differentiate this overlap, which I think we'll, we'll talk more about later. Wonderful, thank you so much. And um, Dan, since he mentioned DDA, I want you to keep that, um, that point in mind about the wonderful things that the DDA is kind of backfilling to address this. So when we get to you, please mention that. Or you know what? Why not just do it now? Go for it, Dan. <laughs> well, I was going to um, uh, really su support something that Dave said regarding the um, uh, the frequency of uh, our diagnosis in the mental health system. We continue to this very day run into um, uh, psychiatrists and other providers who uh, see someone with an intellectual disability or autism and as a result, rule out any mental health um, <laughs> diagnosis. And because the prevalence of, of mental um, health disorders is higher, if, if a psychiatrist or, or service provider sees someone with an intellectual disability, they should initially start with the suspicion that the person does have a mental health diagnosis instead of this is a rule out, we can't serve them because of the um, uh, over, overriding condition of autism or intellectual disability. And, you know, um, yeah, d down the road, um, um, I have a lot to say about um, the Medicaid plan and um, how it works as an obstacle um, for um, people with intellectual disabilities and autism to access appropriate and adequate services. Thanks. Yes, that is a question we're going to ask you towards the end. Thank you. Thank you for stepping in there. So David, um, you know, what do individuals uh, and their caregivers and loved ones expect or what should they ask for from a mental health provider seeking help uh, for their mental health condition? Well, I, I think we skipped an important question at the beginning, which was about access, about the access to mental health and which I think Dan, Dan pointed out. So I want to kind of circle back around to I mean, we tend to look for three, three A's in service delivery, access, appropriateness, and accountability. And I think that access step, we tend to access what we have available. Um, you know, if all we have is a psychiatric inpatient unit to put people in, then that's what we're going to access, right? Um, the access to the mental health system is actually fairly, um, fairly easy, as long as you have a diagnosable mental health disorder. Um, so I think kind of what Dan said is it boils down to this diagnostic overshadowing where everything is uh, attributed to the autism or to the intellectual developmental disability and this, this stigma that goes with that. And then there's this historical of siloed systems and siloed funding models. Um, I think you have to look at how mental health people diagnose, right? They do that through conversations, through questionnaires, and they typically do that of the person who's asking help, 
Um, although, you know, they're, you know, we aren't talking about children, but in children, they, they will use informants. But in the adult world, they're very used to asking the person themselves. Um, a lot of the referrals that go to mental health centers for people with IDD and autism uh, tend to be for some sort of challenging externalized behavior. Now, I will argue that all psychiatric symptoms have challenging externalized behavior. Um, but that, and, and so it doesn't really speak to the cause, but in the mind of the mental health professional, that does get attributed, you know, to, to um, the individual's autism or the other intellectual developmental disability. And, and that troublesome behavior sometimes is considered unacceptable in a lot of support and service venues, which um, again, doesn't, doesn't make it open. Um, there's just a lack of, of training and discomfort with both the prevalence information, the presentation of what that looks like, the amount of time that it takes for system coordination, um, how to adapt therapies. Um, I mean, often one of the requests that mental health providers get is for medications. And I'm not um, you know, saying that medications don't work or might be, but, it, but a lot of times that's an immediate fix that people are trying to look for this idea. Um, there's an unknown causation, which we don't have time to look into, but we'd like a med to fix this you know, challenging behavior, which is the highest cost service in mental health. And it, it also has the longest wait times. So sometimes, you know, the, the, there's a there's a piece around access to, you know, what am I, what is it I'm trying to get that that uh, that is out there. Thank so. you for addressing that first question, which should have been asked first. It was my fault. Uh, the <laughs> access question is where we wanted to start tonight. Thank you for bringing up the fact that some of our in I sit and um, give an interview about their symptoms. We're talking about people with limited verbal abilities, possibly uh, you know IQ issues, and so we we uh, you know we're asking a lot, and and we, we are attributing a lot. Just so thank you for bringing that up. And Dan, did you want to chime in there, or Melanie? No, I think he nailed it. Thank you. Really good. The, well, um, yeah, I do too. Okay. And then you moved on to what should I expect, which is the question you asked me before I jump back to access, because, you know, it's one thing if they can't get in, which is what the access question is. So what you're talking about when you say what I should expect, that's where you start getting into that, um, that appropriateness of care and the accountability that um, providers should have in, when, they're, when they're enrolling somebody in the mental health system. Um, this is, is challenging because, again, you know, you look at what's in the state plan and what's in the WAC. Uh, I was disappointed to see that recently uh, the mental health contract, um, certainly in King County, I think it's this is WAC based, they removed the special pop consultation piece for developmental disabilities. It used to be that when someone presented with a developmental disability that the mental health provider needed to seek out specialized care to find, you know, to get some insight into the case, just like you would if you had some rare disease and your physician needed some help, right? We hope that he would ask the specialist to sort of help guide your care. Um, that used to be in place, it is no longer. Um, but I think what you really wanna look for, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, I think, come up against this time and time again, the idea of that it takes more time to do these assessments, but uh, you're gonna want somebody who says they are performing a good biopsychosocial assessment. Um, and that means that there's system collaboration. It means you are gathering a lot more uh, required info, um, which means, again, that you have to be able to spend time. There's multiple sources that you might be getting that information from. Uh, there is a book called the DMID-2. It's the Diagnostic Manual of Intellectual Disabilities. It's produced by um, the National Association of Dual Diagnosis. That's on dnadd.org. I'm not getting any kickbacks. It's just a book I think that every mental health organization should have. Um, that is a a crosswalk with the DSM-5, and it kind of uh, shows behavioral equivalence and other crosswalks of um, the diagnosis and how that might present in someone with ADD or autism. Um, so if, you know, asking yeah. if they have that available or if they are familiar with that kind of thing would be something. I mean, um, understanding that developmental overlap, um, understanding general strategies dealing with executive functioning. And I think it's interesting because this is a focus on adults. You might find some of those those skill sets in people who work with children because we're talking about developmental stages. We're talking about executive functioning when a lot of the neurotypical population is starting to sort of use that um, is in the child phase, right? So you're getting that in child and family services, but you may not be getting it in the adult world. Um, 
I think I think it's really important that we look at strength based quality of life focus. I think you should be able to expect that from a mental health provider. Um, we are in the business of recovery. And part of what recovery is, you know, building what's strong, not focusing on what's wrong, right? So this this quality of life issue and um, finding the, I mean, I, I loved when you introduced your son and you talked about, you know, his positive qualities. Um, sometimes in the midst of crisis or when people are reaching out to mental health providers, they've sometimes lost focus on that. Um, I mean, there there's a lot of treatments out there and some treatments that I would say, I don't know if we'll get to treatments later, but Things like are they, you know, CBT can be adapted. Um, there's, you know, if you if you're seeing things that say mindfulness training, relaxation, you know, yoga groups, things that target social skills and anxiety, um, you want to ask that their treatment plan is focusing on the core needs, the root causes versus just symptom management. Um, putting a bandaid on something doesn't ever treat the underlying cause typically. Um, I mean, again. You know, they, we want to have a psychiatrist if you're getting a med provider. I think it's important to say um, that people don't know what they don't know. Psychiatrists are only as good as the information given to them. Um, and that goes for the mental health provider as well. So making sure that that kind of information gets there. Those are those are things that I would put on my checklist of, of a mental health provider, I think, if I could. So, David, um, I'm picturing many parents and loved ones and providers writing a lot down there. So thank you. And this is viewable on later. You, you, online later. You gave some great tips. I want to say that in our chat room right now, um, uh, our team is defining some things. There's questions. Um, if, if you don't mind, David, uh, repeating the book again, I think somebody asked for a repeat on that book. Uh, it's called the, the DMID2. It's the Diagnostic Manual for Intellectual Disabilities version two, <laughs> and that is uh, updated to, to match the DSM-5. And that is available, I mean, you can get it from Amazon, you can get it from the NADD.org. Um, that's a, a companion side-by-side -side guide with the DSM. Thank you. Since I have a little pause in my image, I wanna make sure I'm being thoughtful for my other panelists. Somebody okay. also asked Very if I good. could define Thank whack, you. and and again, I'm going to have to go back because again, this yeah. is streaming live, and I didn't do a lot of a lot of the the specialist consultation. It might be in the RCW, but it the whack is the Washington Administrative Code. It's in yeah. it's in one of those two documents, or it used to be, and, and now isn't. So, and it used to be in contract. And this people like on. David, Dan, and Melanie. These panelists, we all geek out on wax, by the way. So you might want to too. They're really interesting. <laughs> Actually, they are. Um, okay, so just to Melanie, but knowing full well that our other panelists can chime in, they have such shared experience and expertise. So it's hard to pick one person for each question, frankly. So Melanie, uh, Melanie is a supervisor of case management at DDA and also the parent of the co-occurring mental health diagnoses. So Melanie, um, for parents and caregivers, Normal is what, sorry, <laughs> for parents and caregivers, normal is what many would consider crisis. So in other words, the frog in hot water. A lot of us live with crisis all the time. Our kids and, or our young adults or adults are going through hard times. There's, there's hard tests and services for the various reasons David mentioned. And so the water's heating up and sometimes we just consider that normal. In your opinion, at what point should parents and caregivers be reaching out rather than just taking it on? This is an awesome question. And um, when I saw this question be posed, I was like, oh, yikes. Um, as a parent, I think the reason why it's so challenging is that I find myself in the same situation. And what I have asked myself in the past, and actually someone had um, at Children's Hospital had been the one to um, kind of approach it this way, was that ask yourself if you were giving advice to someone else who's in a similar situation, if it was a friend or a peer or someone like that, what advice would you give them? And really, you should be taking that own advice yourself. So if you would be encouraging someone to, um, you know, seek support, call 911 or transporting to an emergency department because there is a immediate concerning crisis going on, then you should do that as a parent. Um, if it's looking for ongoing um, mental health services or pursuing you know, crisis stabilization through DDA, then by all means, go ahead and pursue those things. Um, you know, at any time, if it's, you know, I 
just kind of use that as a guide is if you would encourage someone else to get support in the situation that you're currently facing, um, then that's when the yeah. time is that you're beyond what is considered normal and you're in crisis and need to get support. Um, I think families often feel that um, the challenges that they're being presented with, that they're not going to be able to be supported in the mental health um, realm. And, you know, David mentioned this already, but I would say and that's the situation, then you need to be searching for a more appropriate provider. If you have someone who is skilled, um, they're going to be able to have tools in their toolbox. They're going to be able to be creative. He talked about being able to kind of modify those CBT approaches and things like that. Um, you should be able to, you know, ideally a provider is going to be able to um, address issues regardless of um, cognitive functioning or verbal ability in the adult that they are working with. I wanted to tag in on that. I think Melanie, I think, modified uh, CBD. Oh. Go, Go ahead. ahead David. I, I, I was I was just gonna say that I think you know we're we're facing that, you know, you brought up the COVID and the pandemic right now. I mean, caregiver fatigue is real. I mean, this is the real deal right now. Um and I think, you know, when you talk about in hot water, um, you know, I I prefer to hear about it when the frog gets put in the pot, you know, versus by the time it's in the hot water. Um, there's so much more you can do. The earlier, the earlier the intervention, the more likely you're going to have for success. When you get down to the crisis mode, you have very few options and, and those options are pretty limited. Um, but, but I think, you know, we're dealing with this. I, I just wanted to shout out to all the caregivers out there that, you know, this is a, a caregiver fatigue is, is very uh, big issue for us right now. If I can add on to that, um, uh, when uh, you were listing the uh, competencies that you'd like to see a mental health provider have uh, serving people with intellectual disabilities and autism, um, I've always included the fact that clients don't come in as individuals. They come in as a package. Um, there's uh, Most of our clients need some other people in their lives to help support them. And... Um, some of the behaviors and some of the mental health conditions are fairly hardwired wired that you can make some impact on with treatment. Um, but uh, one of the most efficacious things a mental health provider can do is to support the service system or support the family um, uh, and build resilience there in order to keep a person in a stable environment rather than um, uh, uh, the, um, having them blow out because of how um, how stressed people become with some of the behaviors in, in a home setting. So uh, I think a real uh, important competency for a mental health provider is to um, be empathic and uh, caring and be seen as resourceful uh, to families and providers, as well as um, uh, be able to build a relationship with the clients. Thank you, Pam. Uh, and great weighing in, everyone. Uh, I'm still, I'm still as a parent drooling over modified cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, my son has limited verbal ability, and I've always thought CBT type therapy would be great. So I think a lot of parents and caregivers are kind of like smiling right now, thinking there's a that, that could be true. So, uh, okay, Melanie, I have another question for you. Yep. No, go ahead. We have a little delay on my side, so I'm sorry. Go ahead, Melanie. No, I was just going to say, I think, you know, a lot of times yeah. um, those providers who are, you know, open to modifying their approaches to different treatment modalities, a lot of times those are providers who just have kind of this passion and drive to support this population. And a lot of times they've taken it upon themselves to kind of dig deeper and um, be able to kind of self-teach some of those different approaches. Um, but when you find those clinicians, they're gold. They're amazing to be able to, you know, work with. And they're always looking for new ways to be able to support our um, young adults and adults in general. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. 
I bet the chat room's blowing up with people wanting those names of those providers <laughs> in our area. <laughs> Well, I mean, to, to okay. play on that, I, mean, I, so, think, Melanie, I think it's a uh, cultural competency issue. You know, I mean, there's there's this piece that that people need to find, you know, this is what you would do for anybody who you struggle with, right? Absolutely. This is, so I, 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 I want to say, you know, Melanie says, sure, some people have the knack for it, but but if I got somebody from, you know, that spoke Spanish and I don't speak Spanish, how am I going to work with that, right? I'm going to find tools and ways. And I think that, you know, how we view this service is not different from what mental health providers do. They just don't know they can do it. Right. Touche, touche. So we have to, as caregivers and loved ones of some people in this category, in this population and community, we have to demand and expect more and not just demand, but we're a partner with, with providers um, to expect that. Dan, you're looking like you might want to say something. Is that just me? <laughs> I like what other people okay. have said so far. Right. Melanie, next yes. question. <laughs> okay, me too. Uh, Melanie, um, your next question is regarding, um, oh no, excuse me. Uh, walk us through what can be done when an individual is experiencing behavioral or mental crisis, form of aggression, property damage, self-harm, assaulting, or any uns unsafe behaviors like that that are pretty extreme. What are the stabilization services and barriers to care and um, if these services are limited, what advice do you have for those caring for individuals that need this type of stabilization? Absolutely. So um, I super briefly touched on it in the last question was um, the crisis stabilization team. So this particular um, panel, we're all addressing um, individuals who are DDA clients. Um, and so um, with that, we, do have access to the crisis stabilization teams um, throughout the state. Um, and those in King County, um, that would be through Sound. So um, David is, you know, part of that program. Um, Compass Health for um, the North End of Region 2. Um, these services are all available and provides a client with a clinician who um, is skilled, has those um, that skill set to be able to help support, um, try and stabilize our crisis. They can do more um, outreach than what may be traditionally available. They can also help offer some um, support to the family members that are supporting these clients and kind of, kind of walking through the crisis alongside them. Um, you know, ideally, if we would be able to get those supports in place and have them on the ground in the home, um, and but we know that realistically, there's other times where things get bigger than what that can um, help support. And so then we ideally are able to, you know, maybe tap into a mental health stabilization in an acute hospitalization stay. Um, I think the challenge with that that we all know, unfortunately, is that not all of the mental health facilities and hospitals are equipped to um, support our clientele. And so, um, you know, when we have these adults who are presenting with these um, behaviors with the mental health um, diagnoses, as well as the intellectual disability, it creates just a whole different level of challenges that a lot of times the facilities aren't able to um, support, unfortunately, um, which is definitely one of the barriers that we have and are constantly trying to work with. Um, with if we have the crisis stabilization team, hopefully we're able to get them either, you know, if there is a hospitalization that occurs, they can help with that transition back into the community. We love to have them be partnered with a family and with a client if we're working on a move, if we're going in leaving the family home and going into an adult family home or supported living, being able to um, have that crisis stabilization team to be there to help support that transition because those are, you know, moves and things like that are big and stressful for everybody. Um, we add to that where, you know, there may be confusion, not understanding what's going on, being able to have that support is um, incredibly beneficial. Um, be able to, um, you know, they can help get connected to longer term ongoing mental health and kind of do that soft handoff and be able to share maybe what has been successful, what kind of things work for them and be able to help support that you know, permanent clinician that's going to be working with them as well. Um, 
you know, I think with, um, you know, unfortunately, we never have enough um, mental health support in our state, um, and um, that's always going to be something that we run up against. Um, within DDA, throughout all of the regions, we do have um, the mental health resource manager, so Dan's position, where, you know, we do have someone who can help kind of be liaison between um, case managers, families, the hospitals, um, mental health providers, being able to provide resources, do some crisis um, planning if necessary. Um, you know, we do have within DDA some of those services kind of built into what we do and that we can definitely tap into. I always encourage if you are a family member and you have an adult who is struggling and having behavior challenges, please make sure that you are, um, you know, that your case manager with DDA is one of the people that you are reaching out to and keeping informed of those things. Um, and then I also, kind of last on that I think is, um, you know, David mentioned, you know, getting into the um, situation before the pot is boiling, um, you know, making sure that families are also tapping into other resources like out of home respite, um, being able to get those breaks and kind of let off some of that steam and kind of, you know, let the pot simmer a little bit um, before things get um, too far out of control. Um, those are also great opportunities to kind of, you know, practice what it's going to be like if you do ultimately have to look for an alternative living arrangement um, for your adult child who might be living with you. Thank you, Melanie. I, I want to... <laughs> that pesky glitch. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, David. I was just saying that there's also a lot of people who are in those alternative living <laughs> arrangements who are also having those same challenging externalized yeah. behaviors. I think when I think about caregivers, I think about anybody providing care to somebody. And when you get to that point, you know, like we, like you reiterated that if it's if the pot is boiling already, you know, safety has to be first, which leads to a lot of poor decision making because it's very limited. Um, not a lot of things that you can do. And actually nobody really wants to hear my advice or problem solve during the middle of them feeling unsafe either. So, <laughs> so, so I have to remember to attack the safety. Um, one of the pieces there was that, you know, if, if the caregivers who are caring for people in need of stabilization, I would say the best relationship that you can have with your medical provider, your primary care physician would be one of the areas I would say to strengthen. Um, if you're not getting resources in other places, if you can find somebody in the medical community, um, we are seeing, there was a study out of, uh, um, I think it was University of Massachusetts, like in 2014 or something like that, where they found that um, something like 70% of people on an inpatient psychiatric unit that was specially designed for people with intellectual developmental disabilities had a medical condition. So. So we're seeing that kind of impact. And then the other thing I would say is just to focus on quality of life, whatever that means for that person. Um, you know, find, find that happiness. But sorry. Sorry to add on there, Katrina. I cut you off. I'm glad you did. No, it's I have a little delay, so it's going to be irritating. Um, I, I, uh, I wanted to reiterate something Melanie said. Uh, hospitalization and um, the lack of appropriate care for individuals with severe autism and intellectual disability and co-occurring mental health. There is, we hear from a lot of caregivers, loved ones, parents, uh, you know, uh, for home, supported living, that there is not, um, there is, it's not, it's not done in Washington. So uh, a lot of our people who need stabilization uh, often work through their Medicaid plan for out of state if they need acute long-term crisis stabilization. And that's one of the heartbreaks of Washington is that we are we are shipping people outside of Washington because we don't have that care here. Um, and again, the frog, we wanna to get to the frog before it boils. Sometimes you just, no matter what you do, and then it happens. And so we have people very you know, unsafe and unhappy people living with aging parents, being rejected by group homes. It's tough, it's tough. I'm glad you brought that up, Melanie. It's a real problem in our state. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, looking at time here, we're doing really great. We're doing great. Um, so I wanna say, you know, Melanie really answered the addressed question, I think about those challenging and disruptive behaviors. It's a question we get a lot at children's for children, teens and our young adults. 
and um, the therapies that are offered. So I'm going to just ask Melanie or anybody on the panel around those challenging behaviors. Um, if we could just take a moment to talk about what, where do parents, caregivers, loved ones turn for therapies for challenging behaviors, given the person that has autism, intellectual disability, and co-occurring mental health condition. Who wants to take it? <laughs> Depends how much money they have. <laughs> Can I say that on this call? Um, I work in, I work in the, the Medicaid-driven system, mm -hmm. um, which a, a lot of people there don't have a lot of options. Um, I, I think uh, I think I kind of talked about it in that earlier question about the type of. I think there's a lot of therapies that people can do. Um, I think there's a lot of specialists out there. Um, access to them and getting uh, the payment structure in place uh, can be challenging. Um, but I think, you know, some of the basic stuff that I think most therapists learn sort of through their training uh, and, it, and it spans the lifespan is uh, emotional regulation type training. Um, many of you have probably heard of something called like the incredible five point scale or the zones of regulation that was used in schools for a period of time. A lot of times those things are used and taught to people with IDD or autism when they're younger. And then what happens is they age out of those systems and people stop using them. Um, there's a lot of those therapies that I think if you, if you can just revisit those many, like I said, many therapists know these um, and many people with IDD and, and autism are used to them and can respond well to them. It's just they're, they seem to sort of this magic transition age where they, those things drop off. Um, that's the same thing around sensory regulation. You know, are they seeking sensory input or trying to escape it? You know, what does that look like? How do you identify patterns? Um, so I think there's a lot of therapies that are already happening and that they may have even already been exposed to. But by the time you're an adult, it just gets left yeah. behind. Yes. When the bus stops coming, the cliff, the cliff, um, the yellow bus is what I meant. Um, okay. Uh, I'm, my next question is for Dan and Dan, did you or Melanie? Did you have anything you want to say before I move on to Dan I about that? Last thing on that is also making sure yeah. I, I channel David in this. I always have this little David on my shoulder. Um, you <laughs> probably just doesn't know what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> is also making sure you know when we have <laughs> presenting with um, you know with these big behaviors, um, making sure that we're also doing a rollout of any potential kind of low lying, easy to easy reach medical issues. You know, are we, you know, offer Tylenol and make sure there's no headache or tooth pain going on? Can we rule out some GI issues? I think some of those things are sometimes very obvious, but overlooked. And, you know, sometimes those presenting big behaviors can be that simple, unfortunately. And, you know, we see clients all the time that, you know, are dealing with this ongoing stuff. I had someone, you know, not too long ago that it was, it was literally as simple as let's get them some Tylenol on a regular basis and behavior almost went away. Um, so I think that's a huge one that people need to not overlook. Thank you. Ruling out pain. We hear that a lot when we're looking at challenging behaviors. Thank you. And that's the importance of having a regular primary care doctor. Um, so my next questions here, my sixth set of questions um, is for Dan. And he's the mental health risk manager at DDA. And Melanie works at DDA too. So my question is, um, you know, describing some of the supports or services DDA offers to assist individuals enrolled in DDA who have co-occurring mental health conditions. It, you know, she mentioned the crisis support team, but can we hear a little bit more, Dan, about what DDA offers for these folks? Um, well, we also have um, right now some crisis beds, but uh, our uh, supported living programs have been um, by virtue of not receiving adequate increases over the years have become very stagnant and um and so if someone's in crisis and they get to a crisis bed um they, they're stuck there um and um and that has i could go into the economics if you compare the 
cost of living in Seattle to the cost of living in Spokane, the cost of living here is 20% higher, but there's not a, a comparable differential to the pay that we give to our direct care staff. So the turnover here is astronomical for our uh, residential support programs. The rates that we pay for uh, behavioral supports, um, family supports are inadequate. Uh, and uh, we've lost a lot of providers because um, we're paying far below what they can get in other uh, venues for coming in to help write a positive behavioral support plan. And, um, and uh, I just saw the, uh, the state list of what the <laughs> reimbursement should be and um, it won't work here at, on the east side or west side of Washington and it barely works anywhere else. It's really, um, 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 I, I don't know what to make of it really. It doesn't seem um, based on the market research of uh, what people should be making or do make otherwise. Um, the um, uh, Washington state is in the, uh, used to be the 49th worst state in the um, uh, country with a uh, number of inpatient psychiatric beds per capita. And it's not much better now. I think it might be 44, 44th in the country where the average uh, number of Christ, uh, inpatient psychiatric beds is about 22 to 24. And here it's about 10. Uh, and so uh, getting a specialized unit for people with intellectual disabilities is really out of the question when we don't have enough beds to serve people who do need to um, have more intensive treatment in an inpatient setting. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm telling you what we do have, I'm telling you what we don't have. Uh, and it's really frustrating, but um, you know, there is uh, a family support, there's um, um, out, of, out of home supports, RHCs are extremely hard to get in to for a short term stay. Something I was gonna mention before is the sound health team. I really appreciate how feisty are, they are because they are fierce advocates. Not only are they um, skilled at working with uh, clients in crisis, they help parents get to DDA case managers and say, this is what's needed. Um, and uh, I, a lot of families need that. A lot of families need people to um, help them navigate our complex um, systems here in the state. Thank you, Dan. And, Did and I depress you, everyone? Um, you are forgiven. <laughs> um, you, you, you are forgiven for, um, and being, and, and I appreciate your honesty about really starting with the problems. Um, there are problems and you listed some of the barriers first. And um, I, I, I appreciate that honesty and that um, that's important for people to know that there are a lot of barriers right now. And the fact that we have just a complete lack of psychiatric beds for the general population and how that impacts this, this subset is tremendous on families. And it's something I see a lot of burden and strain in our families. Um, and, and turning to DDA for crisis services, I've had DDA, you know, folks, they have, cri they have crisis supports, but they are, they, they are not in the business of doing intensive crisis support. And Melanie and Dan can back me up on that or say it differently, but it isn't, it isn't intensive crisisization. Um, I, I do want to say RHC that Dan mentioned stands for rehabilitate or uh, rehabilitative uh, rehabilitation residential. centers, right? The former residential like for residential. I'm sorry. Yes, like Furcrest, uh, the one in Shoreline. There's in Yakima. There's one. These are um, in former institutions that are very hard to get into, and it's a, it's it's a complex topic. We could have a whole session on it, but um, they're hard to get into, uh, but parents continue and caregivers and, and are turned to it, but it's a issue. So talk to your DDA case manager more about that. Thank you. Okay, any um, thoughts before I go on to the next question? So many thoughts, but we're gonna wait. Okay. <laughs> I know, and okay. So um, I'm gonna turn to Melanie real quick here. And Dan, your, your other two questions are coming after this. Um, Knowing people are fearful of calling 911, maybe fearing domestic violence charges, if their adult child is assaulted, and how law enforcement may interact with their loved one. 
maybe it might their actions might be viewed as criminal as opposed to a manifestation of the person's disability. What's your advice? So I first and foremost, if there is a safety issue, call 911 if you need to. I have done other panels on this topic before. Um, I always say if you need to call 911, know that police are always going to be the first ones that come. Um, that's always scary for um, as parents, whether it's of a child or an adult. Um, it's scary knowing that the police are going to come and that, you know, it may be because your, especially if it's your adult, is assaulting you. You might have injuries. You know, there's so many different things that are going on. But call 911 if you have to. My advice is always when you call, when you're on the phone with dispatch, when you make that phone call, tell dispatch that you're requesting medical support, that you are needing aid, that you, you know, if you're feeling like you need to have transport to a hospital for an assessment or evaluation, then that you're requesting medical, knowing that police are going to come. But also then when you come, kind of when you are making that phone call, explaining first and foremost, kind of leading with that you have an adult with a disability um, and that they are in an acute crisis. Um, rather than, you know, I've heard people call 911 and say, you know, they're assaulting me and, you know, whatever the case may be. And that just the response is going to be very different in those two different scenarios. Um, and then I would also say, if you have a safety plan, if you have, you know, if this is not your first time that you've had to do this, pre before you need to call 911 again, have a one page sheet of, you know, these are the key things that are helpful when engaging with, um, the adult that you are calling on behalf of, you know, if you need to keep space, if you need to, um, you know, talk in a low voice, different things like that, have those things, just a one page, nothing with, you know, a lot of information that, you know, we don't want to give the police, you know, pages and pages of, you know, a behavior plan that they need to look through, but just a quick guide that they can glance over to give them some um, quick pointers. Um, and then know also that when they come to support you, more than likely they are still, even though you're the one that's in crisis and calling and needing help, they are going to defer to you and ask you how they need to be intervening in the situation. Um, so I would say those are kind of the big things. Um, but really, um, you know, really it's making sure you're being cautious in what it is that you're saying on the phone when you are talking with dispatch um, and kind of setting the stage that, you know, this is, um, you know, a mental health issue with an individual with a disability. Um, rather than, you know, this is just, you know, an out of control individual. Um, you know, those are two very different responses that you will receive. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just for everyone's um, information, if you Google um, or, you know, internet search, uh, interacting with law enforcement plus autism, there is some excellent resources out there right now. Handouts, Melanie mentioned having something on hand to give to the police or the law enforcement. There's 911 where you can call and get some information in the system. So if you call, the information comes up proactively. A smart so, 911 And profile. you can also Google, yep, yep, yes. So um, searching for autism in law enforcement and then maybe Washington or your county, some things will come up. There's also some good toolkits out there by a number of autism agencies and organizations from ASAN, Autistic Self-Advocate Network to Autism Speaks for different populations. And it's a very big topic right now because we want our children and our loved ones and our adults to be viewed as um, not criminal behavior when they're just expressing themselves in ways that aren't safe sometimes. But um, we need we need our, our police to come in guns blazing, but to, to respond to the crisis in a way with a de-escalation. Well, there is a, there um, is a CIT I, program, I do, uh, there is a, um, which is crisis intervention yes, trained officers. The crisis um, response team. Yeah, Dan and I have been involved with them. We've, we've kind of followed their progress. Uh, they used to have in their 40 hours of training, I think, Dan, they still have maybe four hours on IDD and, and autism, still a pretty low amount when they're dealing with um, a lot of it's focused on mental health interventions. 
Um, but a lot of those interventions still are purposeful. And if you, you, in addition to things that Melanie said, which was brilliant ideas, I'd say meet them outside. You know, if you hear domestic violence, those are the most dangerous calls that officers respond to. Um, that's gonna uh, that's gonna have them heightened. And I want to remind people, law enforcement enforces the law. So if there is there a law being broken, right? I mean, that's what they're going to be looking for. They're looking for a domestic violence charge. They're looking for a trespassing. They're looking for an assault. They're, I mean, these are things that they're trained to do. Um, you know, there's there's a very large conversation going on right now about police and their ability to respond. And, and should they be asked to respond to a lot of these calls that may not fit law enforcement? And I think that's going to be an interesting development as we move forward um, in, in crisis response and in situations like this. But, but I want to, yeah, family crisis plans are essential, super helpful. The, um, yeah. Um, um, we we might cross systems crisis plans. I didn't realize how many until I looked last week. I've written 580 cross systems crisis plans in King County, um, uh, which script out what you say to dispatch what um, kinds of things uh, are alternatives to calling uh, for outside assistance. But if you need outside assistance, how to get um, law enforcement and uh, crisis and ER social workers and so forth, how to interact with them. Um, there's also a form uh, I developed years ago with the King County Sheriff's Department called Police and Fire Contact Sheet, which is a one page sheet. Uh, and because we got police and information, um, they wanted a certain number of uh, details like colors of eyes and height, weight kind of thing, <laughs> which we don't typically include in our crisis plans, but it, it gives them uh, more reason to look at the sheet and it takes a look at what are the um, issues and what are the suggested responses to help de-escalate. And so um, uh, uh, that's actually been used uh, in two provinces and about five states around the country now because it's it's a one page it's so simple maybe and, more than that dan I've, I've shared it with like at least 11 states <laughs> yeah and and the thing is i made sure that the state bureaucracy had nothing to do with it <laughs> so it's only one page you know? <laughs> and and uh and it didn't have to go through all these reviews and lawsuits and so forth it's very simple Thanks, thanks to the three of you. This is an important topic for our families. Thanks for explaining all the various angles of when we need to call 911. Thank you. Um, Melanie, so if hospitalization is required, so let's say we call 911, it's determined that the person is unsafe in the home and the stop is the hospital. It's the, it's the ER, the emergency room. Um, and then uh, they either will be discharged or there might be an inpatient placement. But regardless, when stabilization has been reached, determined by the emergency room or the hospital, um, what services and supports and programs exist during this step down period, knowing that sometimes hospitals determine discharge, but the individual still requires heavy support to avoid decline and return to the hospital? So, yeah, huge question. Um, I would say in this situation, um, I mentioned it earlier also, when this happens, please, please make sure that your case manager is aware that the individual is in the hospital. So whether you have an adult child who is in supported living and they went into the hospital or they're in your home and went into the hospital, whatever the situation is, let us know. So we have a process that we go through internally with DDA. We have... Um, Dan, we have other counterparts to Dan. They track everybody who ends up um, inpatient. We have communication with the hospitals and we will help advocate and push back if um, just because the hospital says that they're ready to discharge does not necessarily mean that they're ready. If they're saying they're ready to discharge and that they're not meeting medical necessity, but then they're also saying that there was a restraint in the last 24 hours, those things don't jive up. And so we will get involved. We will bring in the managed care organization. We will bring in the healthcare authority. We'll bring in other people to kind of have larger conversations and really make sure that discharge is safe, whether that is that they're not ready to discharge and they need to stay in the hospital longer, um, then we help advocate on that behalf. Um, if it's that we need to, you know, 
you need to give us a couple of days so that we can rally the troops and have a plan in place on how we're going to support them in the community, then we might be advocating for that. Um, other times it is that we are needing to look at kind of an interim situation where, you know, maybe they aren't able to return to a family home um, and we need to be able to pursue supported living or something like that, but we need time and a safe place to be able to do that. And so we might be looking at larger, you know, kind of, you know, higher level supports, like maybe we are looking at accessing an RHC for a short time while we are, um, you know, trying to figure out what the most appropriate option is. That takes time. All of these things, I think the hardest thing that everybody runs into with BDA is that, you know, right now we have up to a year wait to find someone supported living. And so nothing happens fast. So if there's an acute situation where someone's in crisis, they find themselves in the hospital and then the family says, this was too big and we can't have them come back. There's going to have to be some sort of situation that's in place um, before we get to kind of that final destination and that gets really hard. But so I think the biggest thing that I can say always is make sure that um, DDA is aware as early in the hospitalization as possible so that we can have, and I've been on calls where we have, you know, 10, 20 people on a phone call with a hospital um, trying to figure out, you know, we get people, you know, hospital medical directors and financial people and all this stuff. We get a lot of people on these calls where we are trying to, um, you know, all come together and figure out how we're going to support this individual. Um, we don't want to have um, people, we don't want to have unsafe discharges. Um, we know that an unsafe discharge is going to land someone right back in the hospital again. So Melanie, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask that we go to the next question because I thought you answered that beautifully. If you, if Dave or some burning uh, thing to say about that, we'll wait, we'll get you in at the end there. Um, I do want to mention right now because Melanie's talking about an important topic about hospitalization for this population. The developmental disability ombuds or the disability ombuds, DD ombuds, did a report called Stuck in the Hospital which reports um, adults with developmental disabilities stuck in hospitals without medical conditions or need. Most of these individuals were DDA clients who had been receiving residential services or at home with aging parents. When they were ready for discharge, they had no place to go because their residential provider terminated their service or the aging parents were concerned about safety, like Melanie mentioned. And with those long wait times for services, we're having this gap. And I'm hearing parents and loved ones and caregivers saying, my kid, my adult needs a safe place to go. And we just, we don't have that right now. And it's been really hard for people. Um, but again, we're closely with your DDA case manager on that. Okay, Dan, can you tell us about the disincentives to serve people with IDD within community health services that you mentioned earlier? Why does this happen? And are there any exceptions? So um, uh, when a person goes into a... Um, uh, an initial appointment to uh, access mental health supports. Um, a um, there, um, as David had earlier mentioned, it's very, very likely that they have more than a mental health issue that uh, needs to be um, um, addressed because of comorbid medical conditions. It's extraordinarily high. Um, I, I do training with um, Dale Sanderson at Sound and um, also. Um, um, Sean Young, who is an RN at working inpatient at Harborview. Uh, and we've come up with a list of dental issues. People with IDD have seven times the rate of dental issues as a normal population. I mean, some of these um, statistics are really staggering. Thyroid disease, epilepsy, GERD, uh, osteoporosis, cancer. And if you take a look at the rate of um, our clients who have experienced trauma in their lives, which is much higher than the normal population, there's a lot of new studies out um, that de describe the uh, comorbid medical conditions for people who have experienced childhood trauma. And, um, and so um, you may be looking at um, PTSD or a bipolar disorder or even a personality disorder related to um, early trauma, but they also are very, very likely to have medical conditions. 
for a provider to uh, start treatment, it, um, I was reading this, this afternoon, rereading, of course, the uh, Surgeon General's description of blueprint for improving medical care for people with intellectual disabilities. And there are a lot of unreimbursed costs. One thing that Dave mentioned earlier was uh, you need a complete history, a lot you know, of dental, medical, and uh, behavioral health supports. What meds were they on? You need it for a long period of time. That takes uh, a long time to gather, and it takes a long time to wade through all of the um, uh, forms. And that's unreimbursed by the Medi uh, Medicaid system. So the Surgeon General's report, which has not been followed in Washington state, recommends that unreimbursed costs um, be addressed uh, in the Medicaid system. And um, uh, there's, um, there uh, uh, are other barriers like that. However, if you are a, uh, an intelligent and savvy uh, parent who knows how to work the system, you're still gonna have some frustration in terms of getting what, to where you need. But if, you're, uh, if you are a single parent with a, a client uh, with uh, autism or um, have English as a second language, the, the barriers become exponential in terms of accessing um, our support. And we're not doing anything to make it easier. We have the Medicaid plan that David references and it, um, it, do, it doesn't uh, make allowances for the complexity of um, uh, diagnostic and service supports that our um, uh, clients need. Thank you, David. Um, great, great answer. I'm going to keep moving to your next question. And um, not, again, not to cut anybody off, but I really want to, we're getting some great questions in the chat room. And um, really interesting to hear about those disincentives, uh, kind of behind the scene information we need. Um, so Dan, what can parents or advocates do when mental health services are, are denied or are inadequate? And uh, what do they do that is inadequate or adequate? What can they do uh, to- oh, Sorry, uh, I might- <laughs> Sorry, my audio might be poor. I'll repeat the question. What can parents or advocates do when mental health services are denied or inadequate? Okay, so the, the denial uh, is really frustrating. Mental health services for anyone on Medicaid is an entitlement. And um, they ought to be able to speak that language. Uh, they should be referencing the ADA and they should say, this is an entitled service. Um, the, uh, then the second barrier is that um, the mental health system gets to decide whether they have an access to care diagnosis. And outside of, you know, sound is extraordinarily good at uh, taking a look at diagnostic issues. But if you <clears throat> go to a, um, an agency that really doesn't want to support our clients, they won't find a diagnosis and they'll deny services. And so um, uh, that's when uh, you, know, you call uh, my counterparts around the state and say, this is what's happening. Whereas we've been told by Olympia to call the MCO, <laughs> uh, the, the medical care organization. And uh, for me, that's impractical. I have 80 people at any given moment, and I'm not going to call the MCO for 80 different people. But if, if there's a uh, really blatant um, service denial, an MCO um, uh, case manager should be able to be at least alerted and asked to assist. Um, and then we have waiver specialists in Olympia who are now in conversation with uh, the healthcare authority, which has devised this Medicaid plan. And I'm trying to um, uh, advocate for uh, for a, um, a more robust support. Right now, um, our uh, psychiatric services uh, in the contract with Sound is under attack. And, um, and it's sort of a precursor. We're starting to be asked to justify crisis supports. Um, and why can't that be provided by a generic crisis team rather than through the DDA contract with Sound? I mean, uh, uh, things are getting really tight and a, a little absurd uh, when you take a look at the fact that um, uh, these resources are not readily available. So 
call the MCO, call um, the mental health case manager at DDA, and um, and um, and ask: Is there someone in your office who's in in conversation with a uh, healthcare authority about lack of access issues? Um, if you take a look at the um, rate of mental health enrollment in King County, we have about 1,400 of our clients out of about 15,000 clients in King County enrolled with DDA who are also enrolled in the community mental health system. Why is there such a disparity between that and anywhere else in the state? Why, why, what is the cause of that disparity? And I think um, part of it is not only just education and helping people understand that these, these people um, can be treated and assisted, but I think there's a financial disincentive because of the complexity of care our clients need. Wow. Um, I felt head shake across the universe on that. Thank you. Uh, very, very articulate and, and important information for us to know. Um, I, I did write down the importance of people to contact their MCO um, because right now DDA and the healthcare authority, the um, HCA, they are talking, they're trying to figure things out, but we have to keep making their, our loved ones needs known and waving that flag over and over. And um, you know, it's nice to see DDA and the healthcare authority talking, and we hope that there'll be some services pushed forward from this conversation. And then along comes COVID, right? But um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, actually, no, let's talk about it now. We have five minutes before it's the Q&A. So does da David, Melanie, or Dan, wanna, any of one of you or all of you um, have any insight on how COVID has impacted these systems and services? And we'll try to end that at, at 8.15 and go right to questions if that's okay with everyone. I feel like we should punt this to David because you have done interviews on this already. <laughs> yeah, the- um, No, David. No, it, it hasn't affected it at all. No, it's, it's, it's it, the, th this is, I think the strangest thing about this pandemic it is it's the first time that everyone is experiencing the same thing together, right? So our individuals who have these negative life experiences that people don't, uh, that other people don't have, we are all going through this pandemic together. And you're seeing this rise in interest in mental health for the general population, right? There's an increase in anxiety, one article. There's an increase in depression. There's isolation is gonna ruin our children. Um, there's anger that people are having within their families. There's grief when they're missing out on the things they used to do. You know, the, the fear piece that, you know, so I think I think that's the the biggest impact of COVID is that we're all actually going through it together, <laughs> which also means it's a little harder to lean on those those quality supports that Dan talked about, which makes such a difference in people's lives because those people are also suffering. Um, so I think what what we've uh, I mean, certainly services are impacted. We went from at Sound doing like three telehealth services in February to doing five thousand in June. I mean, this is this is uh, part part of that ramp up. I think is um, we really noticed the technological gap in outreaching adults with with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autism. Do they have iPads? Sure, a lot of them have iPads. Do do some of them have smartphones? Yeah. Do they want to use it to talk to me? No. <laughs> you know, so trying to figure out what that gap looks like, you know, is is a Zoom meeting enough? Can we've done a lot? I mean, with this, we've noticed that HIPAA has rate, you know, um, gotten rid of a lot of these uh, protective barriers that they had put in for certainly a good reason at some point. Um, but the fact that we can use FaceTime or or an app called Google Duo because a lot of our clients have. Um, uh, different kinds of phones than we have, right? So you're able to do these things. And with those, we're able to do groups and we can connect individuals together. Um, and that is so so helpful. Um, we've delivered a lot. Um, I know DDA got some some uh, technology pieces that they've been able to, to put out into the field. We um, have a lot of donors who have donated money to our um, sound safety net fund, which we've been able to, to redistribute. We've actually put iPads in both valleys um, Medical Center and Highline uh, to where we could assess clients in the emergency room via iPads during this time. Um, 
we're doing a lot of outreach just to people's homes and socially distanced visits where we're standing in the driveway or we're bringing a chair and we're setting it outside of their their front door. Um, and again, sometimes those are well tolerated and sometimes they're not. Uh, we also have you know individuals who are actually doing somewhat better than we would ever would have expected. Um, you know, where now there's very few demands being placed on them and the, the challenges that, that drove them into care in the first place are no longer there. Um, we may have a big issue with reintroducing things and getting back onto a normal and regular schedule that we're going to see. Um, but, but some people are actually doing better than, than, you know, neurotypical people that I'm seeing here. And, um, and then we have others who just, you know, when you lose the, all that quality of life. Um, you know, we're trying to say when we get referrals now, would this have happened if COVID didn't happen, right? That, that's, a, that's a question that we kind of ask because it changes maybe how you look at what's going on with the individuals, part of that biopsychosocial assessment. Like Dan said, looking at baseline behavior over time, would we have noticed this medical condition that got worse because they weren't there, right? So, I mean, anybody else who has anything on it can certainly jump in, but... We're so happy to have sound responding. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's why I was thank you, thankful, David, that you were able to chime in on that because I know that you guys have done a ton of, you know, just kind of creative things. Um, you know, you mentioned that DDA that we had been able to, um, we had gotten um, some technology um, given to us from actually from the healthcare authority that they had gotten um, iPhones and data plans. And so we were able to, in order to help clients access technology so that they could either, you know, access therapies or participate in um, respite in the community through a Zoom platform or something like that, we were able to kind of bridge that gap for some people, um, which was, you know, I mean, it's been really interesting to see how quickly um, everybody has really kind of rallied together and figured out how to make technology work through all of this. Um, I think one of the benefits to this population is they are all very tech savvy already. And so kind of in some ways had a leg up a little bit. Um, so, you know, I right, think it plays it, into some of their strengths. Right? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, but definitely still, you know, I think that my biggest worry is, you know, that, you know, isolation tends to, um, you know, be a challenge for um, this population as well. And is this kind of pushing people to that isolation piece um, inadvertently? And are we going to see that struggle kind of on the back end when we try and reintegrate back into things? Is you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of how things play out down the road. Right, I have a statement that says, nothing creates a crisis like boredom. Right. <laughs> Yes. Okay. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna just uh, do one thing right now, and we're gonna move to the questions. But I, based on what I heard there, and so much for that thought insight. I do want to reflect a few comments I hear a lot from our families and caring for people is that there are a group of individuals who are really really struggling. I mean, everybody is I know, but if an individual can't use a technology to participate, is not in group therapy, it there's so much isolation and devastation to accessing services and the stoppage of school and all that structure and routine, we're seeing families are, are pretty devastated and individuals are, and, and I'm not meaning to be on here, it's more to, to reflect that population that Melanie mentioned too, that there's some there's some real um, devastated families because of COVID and we're caring for loved ones within this population. Um, so we will keep being unique and trying to serve them. I think I'm going to end with um, the questions here. We're going to have some time. There's four questions, I think, that sounds like they're out there. So if you can, if we can kind of move quickly through the questions, I just need one minute at the end to make a quick announcement. So, um, okay, uh, go ahead and share those questions, the first one on the screen there. I'll read it out loud. I'm a new caregiver and loved one for a young man who, who needs expertise. I hear David say that some level of access is easy. I might have missed some the context in that comment. I wonder if panels could summarize where the biggest gaps are accessing services in Washington right now. I'll, yeah, I'll correct. And uh, that. let's give that about two, maybe two minutes. Yes, access is is easy in the fact that they're not screening out. Um, in the in the old access to care days, you had to meet a fairly 
significant mental health disorder to get mental health treatment, that those have been lifted. It can now be for um, you know much much lesser uh, or you know in the in the ranking of mental health disabilities. So access to care really means what what diagnosis does it take to get you into mental health care? So those are those have opened up greatly, which also helps this this group. So I think um, um, I think that's what I was meaning. It, it still is going to be really tough if you have somebody who doesn't have the time to understand what you're bringing, doesn't understand the language, doesn't understand the the root cause of the challenging behaviors that you that are being experienced. So, I mean, I, I, we we love to do free consults. I mean, luckily, you know, uh, you have Dan, you have Melanie, you have myself, who certainly can can give some guidance, and that's part of what we do. So. I believe all of our emails will be on here. Um, you can reach me on the the IDD at Sound Facebook page. There's a lot of different ways to get a hold of one of us, um, no matter where, whether you're in this county or not. So, uh, I don't think we have your email addresses on this PowerPoint. So um, uh, maybe we can talk how to get that. Out. I don't know, you know, how you want people to contact you. I'm sorry, I didn't include email addresses. I didn't do that. So. You can either put them in the chat room afterwards if everybody gives thumbs up or are they just maybe they call their DDA case manager. Okay, um, next question. Thank you, David. As someone who has a young adult accessing mental health services through sound, I have found many of the people are not well trained or part in working with IDD and autism. Is there an additional training that sound provides six their providers working with our special population. David, what do you probably see in the most appropriate to answer that in a few minutes? Um, uh, yeah, I, I can certainly answer. I mean, Sound is a large organization, right? Um, it has, you know, again, in, in any organization you have, I think, I think Katrina described them as the stars, or, or or that was Melanie, somebody, you know, all the way, all the way through. Certainly, um, folks in the IDD services program, um, the clinicians, depending on how new they are. They go through an 18 week um, orientation. So that lasts 18 weeks um, where they're learning everything from what is IDD um, to how those mental health uh, pieces, you know, overlap um, all the way down to adaptable treatments and things like that. We've got um, connections nationally with a lot of uh, national organizations which help add to the expertise. Um, I don't think we can ever know it all. And I think we're always improving. Um, one of the, the famous quotes by Maya Angelou that, you know, um, which I can't remember right now, but it's something around, <laughs> around, you know, do what you know, and then when you know better, do better, something like that, right? And, and I think that we're always striving for that love of learning to continue to do better. So, I mean, definitely, hopefully, my email is davido at smh.org. That's the easiest one, davido at smh.org. Um, reach out to me and we can talk about it. And some of it could be that people aren't understanding some of the underlying other comorbid conditions. Um, like I said, that DD consult piece was removed. So it's, um, so people aren't reaching out as much as they used to, to you know get that expertise and that help and that support. So definitely wanna um, make sure you're, you're getting a good, good treatment. Thank you, David. Um, we'll take the next question. This is from Cheryl. Why can't we utilize the RHCs better? I think they are one of the best options for a person with IDD mental health. As an example, my son was manic with psychosis and had a medical condition from the mania, severe hydration, lost some weight there. Um, and uh, to keep you know, he needed to keep it in his room because he was uh, scaring the other patients. He kept it in his room. Okay. This was a pediatric medical floor. When he went to the inpatient unit, um, so I'm, I'm hearing from Cheryl, basically, sorry, it's dot, dot, dot. Why don't we have uh, Melanie or Dan talk about the RHCs? Why can't we utilize them better? Absolutely. I think um, we all would love to see us be able to use the RHCs for that stabilization more frequently. Um, I think it's a difficult question just to kind of do a blanket answer on. Um, you know, 
challenges with RHCs, that's always going to be kind of the last resort kind of option. And so we're definitely going to be wanting to utilize things in the community, just like with all of the other um, services, you know, when we're working with kids, we always have to, um, you know, whether it's insurance or school or anything, we're always having to utilize those um, kind of community-based resources first and exhaust those. Um, it really is no different um, with the RHCs. And so we really need to look at, you know, are there other supports that are going to be able to better meet the need? The challenge with the RHCs is that it is an institutional setting and there are legalities around um, how that can be accessed and when that can be accessed. And until that is, um, you know, until things are maybe you know the stringencies around that are lessened there's going to continue to be this challenge in actually getting someone into um one of the rhcs um you can request that as um a location for we sometimes um we have individuals who maybe have um significant needs and families want to access out of home respite and can't safely do that in a supported living setting and so sometimes we will um, be able to access the rhc as an option for um, a you know two week out of home respite option other times we look at rhcs for we call it an um, short-term stay um, where we are looking at um, you know a 30-day stay for some um, maybe some stabilization or something like that um, when we're doing that we always have to make sure that there is a transition plan that is um, you know, kind of immediately accessible um, at the end of that stay. So they really want to know that it's not going to be a situation where we say, you know, yes, we will, you know, authorize this 30 day short term stay. And then at the end of the 30 days, the family's like, yeah, you can just keep them there and we're not going to actually pick them up. And so, you know, we run into those kinds of things, too. So we just have to we have to be really cautious. Um, and that we are not, um, you know, essentially, you know, taking away a client's rights to be able to ser be served in a, com in a community setting. That is the direction that the state of Washington, that voters have said that they want people um, with IDD to be served in community settings, that they do not want um, our, you know, this population to be served in, you know, congregate care. And so um, that unfortunately, has some other effects to it in that there are individuals that really do need that level of support and aren't able to access it. And so, um, you know, that's just the unfortunate realities of, you know, one of those things where laws get voted in um, and have some unintended consequences. And I think that's kind of one of the things that we're running into um, with accessing RHCs. I think um, just to, to tag on Thank to that. Thank you, Melanie. For, since um, diplomatic you know, answer. <laughs> yes, well, and, and it's not. You know, I think the people say, "Well, why the RHC?" The RHC is really good because they really kind of have this unlimited funding source. They can do that full biopsychosocial assessment that we've been kind of stressing is super important. Now, if we could find a way to get through those disincentives, like Dan said, where this could be done in the community. And it would be funded by MCOs or it'd be funded by the healthcare authority. We wouldn't need the RHCs as much, right? We'd be able to access a neurologist to talk about someone's seizure disorder and how that significantly impacts, you know, the rest of their life and how that overlaps with, you know, his uh, behavioral discontrol or some of the emotional regulation stuff that happens around that and around the anxiety that comes with that, as well as some trauma that he had had when he was a kid. You know, I mean, all this stuff adds up. And when you aren't able to pull those things together, it's challenging. I mean, I think, I think we're doing, you know, the community is doing the best it can in, in trying to really identify those, the, the, that full array of who this person is, because it is whole person care. And that's what the MCOs are preaching is whole person care. So my hope is that the MCOs will step up. They can only provide what's eligible in the Medicaid state plan. So we need the Medicaid state plan, like Dan said, you know, you know, travel is not included, which means that we're not able to go see people very easily because it cuts into this non-reimbursable services, right? So some of those kind of things that, I mean, he brought up some other ones, but that's just, I think, a basic one. Trying to get to people isn't even paid for. I could go on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I, I want to say that um, this is a very hot topic for a lot of people because when we take away access to places where our loved ones are dignified, treated dignified, it's safe, they're not tied to a gurney or over-medicated like in a hospital. 
there, is, there aren't those kind of facilities. So there are people languishing in either their homes or hospitals uh, because we don't have a place to go. We threw the baby out with the bathwater. And um, as I think I, a good quote I just heard, or laws are voted in by those who are not living the reality of the chaos. So those who are living in the chaos right now, uh, hang in there. Um, I think you're hearing three experts identify this is a giant need. Uh, there it is, laws voted in by the people not in the middle of the chaos. Thank you, Andrea Miller. Um, we, we uh, I like that quote, I think it's very accurate. So to all those living that, you're, we see you. These professionals hear you. We don't have answers that, to that yet. There is not a safe and dignified place for our loved ones to go immediately when they're in crisis. So hang in there. Um, I don't, I don't know if we have time for one more. Um, was there, uh, I'll just check my moderate, see if there's, I want to end at 8.30. So I think I'll probably just, um, I'll probably just close with a couple of things, announcements here. Is there any last comment by our panelists who didn't get a chance to say something on, on their, pressing on their heart or mind right now? I mean, I'm just glad we had this discussion. Okay. I think, I think the hospitalization piece is a big piece that I think all Dan, I, and Melanie could have talked about that for the rest of the night. Absolutely. Um, I think I think we also identified a big thing here was access, um, but that that I think there is expertise and there's and there's places that, that we people can access that. There's a quote by Einstein that says, "The world as we created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking." So speaking to those laws that are voted, I mean, I think we just have to come up. You know, we have a lot of bright minds and I think we can think our way out of this. Um, and then we just, you know, that, that's how we got here. And so we now we just do better. Okay. And, you know, thanks for your, your hearts and your minds on this topic tonight, panelists. I really want to thank Melanie, Dan and David for taking their evening and sharing their knowledge, their expertise, their passion and their concern for this population. Thank you so much. If we were in person, I'd give you flowers and a Starbucks card instead. I'll just, I just got a little thank you note on the PowerPoint, you know? Um, so all the handouts tonight are listed in the chat room and we try our best to follow along of the things that were mentioned. If not, write your questions in the chat room and we'll try to get back to you. Um, you might be interested to know that um, this, this same topic, like I said, is gonna be tackled next month for individuals not enrolled in DBA and have a co-occurring mental health condition. Um, we, sh we shed some light on these issues. We, we, had, we, need, we need powerful advocacy now. So a call to action in some ways. And I'll, I'll just end with a quote by Martin Luther King. Uh, oh, oh, thank you, my behind the scenes people before the Martin Luther King quote. Here's some advocacy and support aid. So the call to action. Here are places you can put your energy, your voice, uh, your feet, uh, whatever you need to do to get um, to get your story out so we can start to make some changes to these systems. Thank you. And my last uh, quote here is, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Keep hoping. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you again for our panelists.